Hi there, folks. Well, welcome to the craziest uh, the presentation that you will see all summit long. Uh, this started with kind of a, a fun set of possibly recreational beverages and giggles um, <laughs> about how challenging it is to explain OpenStack to non-technical people. And being the least technical person in the room, I'm a very good guinea pig for testing these analogies. <laughs> so um, first of all, we wanted to just introduce ourselves. I'm Heidi Joy Trethaway with the OpenStack Foundation. And as part of my day job of senior marketing manager, I run the user survey. I work with the product work group and um, work on stuff like the, the marketing side of the Newton software release. Tyler, what do you do? Sure, my name is uh, Tyler Britton. I work for IBM on the Bluemix Private Cloud, our managed OpenStack service. Hi, I'm Shamal Thahir. I'm at IBM. I'm an offering manager, which is a product manager. And uh, in the community, I work in the product working group, enterprise work group, and the operator stacks team. Cool. So we're going to try to take you through nine key questions and some cool analogies to go with them. And the first one is just, what is OpenStack, Tyler? Sure. So, so this is something we hear a lot of confusion about, uh, especially when you're comparing OpenStack to other technologies. And they'll be like, oh, this is, this is just like this. It's the same thing. And, and they see OpenStack as this one big blob of, of technology that does everything, whereas it, it's, it's much more kind of plug and play. So, so the best analogy we saw here was, is food. Uh, so OpenStack test is the grub hub of, of technology. So it's that middle cloud layer, and then it, you're plugging in whatever underneath. So just like Grubhub, I can go online and order from a bunch of different restaurants, and I can choose different restaurants, and, and they bring it to me. I don't, I don't have to deal with the restaurants directly. Grubhub takes care of that for me. That's what OpenStack does with the underlying technology. So if you choose, for example, KVM as your hypervisor, or VMware, or Zen, or Hyper-V, um, OpenStack's that in-between layer, so I'm just calling up OpenStack and asking for, say, an instance, and then it's going and getting it from, say, KVM and bringing it back to me. It's the same way Grubhub is going and um, ordering ribs. They're going to the, the, uh, to the rib restaurant, picking them up, and, and bringing them to me at, uh, at my house. I really liked how you were explaining this to me as um, the important thing to know is that OpenStack isn't the food. It isn't the kitchen. It's the orchestration of bringing the thing that you want to you. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's the power of it. It's so pluggable. So, you know, whichever components that make sense for your environment. So if you want to use, you know, NSX or, or open virtual networking or no matter what you want, OpenStack makes that connection for you. So yeah, I think a lot of times people make the assumption of OpenStack con contains all those things automatically where they don't. There may be most commonly used stuff like, you know, burgers may be from uh, maybe the number one thing on Grubhub, but you can still get all of those other options. Yeah. And just like Grubhub, I mean, I think another powerful thing here is if you're using Grubhub, as Grubhub gets new restaurants, their menu expands, and you can use, you know, you can order those things as well. And OpenStack is the same thing. As more drivers come online, you get the benefit of orchestrating and controlling more things behind the scenes. Oh, absolutely. I think you see it the most in uh, Cinder, of all places, where there's yeah. just constantly new drivers for new storage companies, new technologies that you can then integrate into uh, your OpenStack environment. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of ways you can use OpenStack, um, we asked, what are the different ways you can use OpenStack? Because there are all of these different service providers that are helping people to use OpenStack. And we thought a good analogy here was coffee. Uh, this idea that there are maybe three different ways that you can get to yourself to a venti latte in the morning. Um, for example, you can go straight into Starbucks and order the um, half-calf, extra hot, no foam, skinny, venti, caramel latte, and get exactly what you want provided by this barista. And that's a bit like managed cloud. You give them all of your specifications, and presto, you are receiving this thing tailored exactly to your needs. Uh, if, you, if you look at distributions, or distros, as we call them, that's a little bit more like having your own Keurig. You have certain packaged options, and uh, it's, it's something that you can really manage on your own, and, uh, but at the same time, you have uh, a limited set of choices, and yet those, set, those sets of choices are nicely packaged for you, nicely tested for you, um, makes it a lot easier for you to deploy. Or you can freeform it, do the DIY version, and download the code yourself, do all the packaging and all of the testing by yourself. Or in the case of coffee, roast your own beans, grind your own beans, uh, you know, go milk your own cows if you like for your latte, and serve up your perfectly French-pressed roast. 
Yeah, I, I love this analogy because it, it covers the, the trade-offs as you move across the spectrum, right? From this side is the easiest, but also the most restrictive to the most free form, but the most difficult. So then it's finding what makes the most sense for, for your, t your particular tastes. <laughs> Yep. All right. Well, Shamil, let's talk a little bit about the big tent, because that's definitely something that people yeah, have a so lot of questions about. That comes about. up pretty often, actually. And yeah. so the best way we thought about how to describe the big tent was we started thinking about tents. And that actually led us to think about, you know, a farmer's market, for example. So if you look at the big tent, in the big tent, uh, there's a set of criteria that, you know, as long as you adhere to the OpenStack four opens, uh, you can become a part of big tent. Much like a farmer's market, you know, anyone can uh, pay the fee and set up a booth and a table. And as long as there's, you know, meeting certain guidelines about where they can put signage, how much signage can they put, how much real estate they have, they're good. And you can, and you can sell your, your goods at the market. Um, likewise, uh, there's also a notion of, you know, when you go to a farmer's market, generally over time there might be st booths or stalls that are more popular than others. And over time, the farm markets become known because of those things, whether it's beet, you know, honey or whether it's a certain produce uh, stall. But because of that, over time, they, attract, they become the attraction to the farmer's mm -hmm. market in a sense. And because of that, uh, the farmer's market in return will give them you know, preferential placement. So when people walk in, they're right there. They might give them expanded real estate so that way they can accommodate the huge crowd that they have. And that's how we look at like, kind of like the core services as well, where in the big tent, everything is officially an OpenStack project, but we still have a set of services that are more popular and widely adopted uh, based on the user survey that we consider the core services of OpenStack. And so that's how, over time, they're all welcome, but some of them do get better placement or uh, become more popular. As, because they become more popular, they get better placement, or in our case, they become a core service, more or less. Uh, the interesting thing is also to draw contrast to what the old process used to be like here. So before we had the big tents and where everything was an official project that met the four opens, we had uh, the integrated and uh, release cycle, which basically a project started and it would um, be an incubated project and it would then apply to become integrated. And there was actually a graduation checklist, like literally about 15, 20 things. Uh, is there pe are there people using it? Uh, is, you know, is the team diverse? Do you have multiple con companies contributing to it? And, you know, in this analogy, that would be like your supermarket, mm -hmm. where basically you have to work with a buyer. Once you work with the buyer, you negotiate which, you know, which shelf you get in product <laughs> placements. And by the way, as you're more popular and you sell more or you negotiate better rates because of volume, you get better placements where you're in the middle versus the bottom or the top of the, aisle, of the shelf itself. Those are great market systems for analogies. Um, let's talk a little bit about office space and uh, <laughs> what are virtual machines, containers, bare metal, what's the difference between them? Tyler. Yeah, this, is, uh, this has gotten even more confusing lately as before. It was like, well, we have bare metal and we, we, we do virtual machines, that's fine. Then we put the containers on top and it's pretty straightforward. But now we're getting the, we're putting containers on the bottom and then virtual machines on top of that. And then we may put containers on top of that. So it gets pretty confusing. So, so we found was we think a office building uh, or office space is the best kind of analogy for that. So your bare metal is like your whole building. So if, if your company needs um, an entire office building, you're generally either buying it or signing a really long lease, uh, but they're building it exactly to your specifications. How many bathrooms you want on each floor, you know, break rooms, what they look like, how the whole setup is, uh, especially if you're building it from scratch, you know, you have architects and they're, and they're building exactly as you want. So you're generally making a pretty big commitment, but you have the entire control of that space. Um, and that is, you know, as close as you can get to just getting a bare metal server, whether you're using Ironic or, or, or what have you. Then the virtual machine, we think, is more like an office suite. So you still have control over your space. It's a smaller space. Generally, the commitment is as long either because you're, you're taking a space out of a building and you're sharing that, that, you know, that there's other suites in that building of other companies. Uh, so now you still get to have some control. So you have your own bathrooms and your own uh, break rooms and things like that. And you'll have some control over how your space is set up. But they're still within the confines of the building. So they may say, oh, this corner space includes you know, two bathrooms. And this is what you get. Even if you want four of them, that's what that space comes with. Um, so you still have those. And that's like you know, an equivalent of a VM. You have virtual hardware. So here's your virtual NIC. Here's your virtual disk. Uh, so you have the feeling like you're in your own building. But there's, there's still some restrictions on that. 
And then um, the container, the best is, is the rent and office space. So the Regis's and stuff of the world where you can get an office for as, as short as you know, a day or hours. Where you, the, the, the core services, if you will, are, are pre-built. So you have the, the bathrooms are where they are, the break rooms are where they are. All that stuff is set up that way and you just get your individual office space. Uh, so just like a container, if they're running on Linux, you can, you know, you can, your container could be Alpine Linux, even though you're running on Ubuntu and things like that, but you don't get to change the underlying uh, pieces. You're just sharing the CPU and RAM and things like that, whereas the underlying disk and network, and that's just controlled by the, the VM or, or, uh, or bare metal server that you're running on. So it's, it's kind of that, that same continuum of as you get kind of the more granular, and it's also in general, a shorter lifespan. So usually you're buying a, a physical server, you're keeping it for three or four years. A virtual machine, generally some point, period less than that, and then containers could be you know, minutes or hours. Yeah, and they're more configurable, or the uh, bare metal or the virtual machine, being more configurable as well as having the longer lifespan. And it's, it's also about, like, you know, this analogy works in multiple ways where there's also the sharing of resources, right? Where oh, yeah. you, you have your receptionist, uh, for example, in a Regis type model, in a container model, you have, you're sharing resources, so you're kind of using the kernel and building on top of it. Yeah. Um, with a virtual machine, everyone has their own office and everyone has their own receptionist still. Yeah. There's yeah. still, yeah, there's still some, some contention for resources there, but the yeah, container are really sharing all yeah. of them at that level. And then bare metal, it's, it's, as long as you can fit it in your building, you're, uh, you're good. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, love it. Uh, Shamali, do you talk about op interoperability? Please. Yeah, absolutely. So interoperability, and specifically what I want to talk about is, you know, explaining interoperability in the OpenStack way of what we do with the interoperability. And so the best way to think of interoperability in OpenStack is to think about, uh, you know, plug standards or pow power outlet standards, effectively. Um, so in this case, the OpenStack API is really much like a, uh, a, a plug. And so you have standards defined here. And the cool thing about that is once you define the interface, it doesn't matter whether I'm plugging in a toaster, a laptop, or anything. I can plug in because they're all using the same interface. And it also doesn't matter whether I'm plugging that laptop or uh, toaster into my office or my home or maybe a hotel, wherever. And this plays out really well because in the OpenStack land, you can think of your applications, cloud-native applications, or just applications in general that you're developing and running as being the utility or like you know whether it's a fridge or a toaster. That's what you're really building. And you're relying on the power outlet or the API interface in this case to be standardized to where you can build an app that will fit it. And as long as your app fits that interface, you're good. And then likewise, that the house or the office could be considered different OpenStack clouds in this case. So I can develop an application. I can use a standard defined interface that's been tested for interoperability in these different things. Like a, you know, an inspector will come in and make sure that you're adhering to standards that are set. And once that's done, you can use your application or your appliance in any place that, that uses that standard. Yeah, I mean, you could even extend it even further. If you, like, you can get a power inverter in your car and plug your blender in, you know, your <laughs> Margaritaville blender. Okay. Oh, my. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in the, you know, a tailgating or something like that. Well, it's just the, the, we've seen that code other places where, hey, there's not really OpenStack behind it, but people have even built these kind of API converters. And it's just that's the key thing from the application's perspective. As long as the plug looks like a normal plug when they go when you go to plug it in and it and it works the way it provides the power and follows the spec, then exactly. uh, you're good to go. I implementation is less important. Like the cord size doesn't matter at that yeah. point. Yeah. What matters is the plug at the end of the day. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, one of my biggest problems is where to park my Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> Pause for laughter. Um, <laughs> no, uh, uh, the way that I'm learning about the difference between block storage and ob stor object storage is if I were to actually have this problem of where to park my Porsche. And uh, the, the options that I have are on a block storage basis, I could rent a storage unit. And then that becomes mine all mine. I can put my Porsche in there. If I decide to get a Winnebago instead, I need to go get a bigger storage unit. Um, I can also take my Porsche out and then um, I still have this block storage space, this, this rented storage unit um, that I'm going to have to pay for whether I store anything in it or not. 
Now, the other way to do it is with object storage. It's effectively like handing the keys of my uh, imagined Porsche <laughs> to a valet. Uh, he gives me a ticket, and then I'm off on my merry way. When I want my Porsche back, I say, here is my ticket. This is kind of the code for where you have storage, my, stored my object, and um, he brings it back to me. Now, we we're talking about how this analogy works and also kind of where it breaks down. And I, I like the, the point that in object storage, if the valet runs off with my car, uh, not only is he going to store it, but he's also going to make a couple of copies of it so that if it gets a door ding, when I get my car back, I get the one without the door ding, uh, which, which is a very interesting way of doing it. So um, what, what would you add to this? Yeah, I think, I mean, I. I'd be interested to see if the ability to quickly 3D print cars, the, the first use case was backup cars at, of high-end yeah. cars of valets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but no, I, I think that's the, the, the main piece is the, the unit of measure, right? So, so in this case, in object storage, it's the, it's the car. It's the object. Yes, whereas when you go to a storage unit place, you're not saying, I need spot for a Porsche. You're saying, they're like, these are the sizes I we need have. a block of storage. And you're like, here's, we, ha we have a 10 by 20. Will that work for you? Yep. We, or all we have left is the 20 by 40s for an RV. You're like, well, I have to, that's the only one you have, so I'll get that. So that it doesn't matter how much you consume, you're paying for that whole thing. Yeah. And the other thing here is, it, another difference is, just like when you hand the keys to the valet, he gave you a number, right? And mm -hmm. you don't care where your car's parked. It's their responsibility right. once it's there. And you just have to provide that number to get it back. Whereas in your storage unit, if you have to remember what number your car's parked in. If they all look the same and you forget which storage number your car was in, <laughs> it's you're not going to get it back. So you have to know like, a more specific path of where your car is stored versus in yeah. valet, you just have to know Here's my number yeah. that I gave that you gave me when I gave you my keys. Yeah, you're responsible for the yep. locations of everything in the block world. So even your your Porsche has snow tires and they're buried in the back of you better know where they are in your storage unit or you need you know, to you know what's in your storage unit. Yep. Please put a Porsche in my storage <laughs> unit. I would appreciate that. Well, let's talk about how networking works in the cloud. Yeah, so so this is uh, this is a often a very confusing uh, spot, especially once you get into overlay networks and um, you know, micro segmentation, all these type of things. So the best way we can wrap around it is mail, which mail is actually a very classic networking analogy, right? So like, oh, the, the IP address is the address and, you know, kind of working through. So like, how does overlay networking uh, work into that? So with physical networking, the, you, you, you fill out your, you write your letter, you put it in the envelope. The envelope has the, the to and the from, just like your, your packet does, and you hand it to the mailman, which in this case you're handing it to the router, the closest router, and it, and it goes from there. Um, that, still, that still applies today. It's how our physical networking is happening. Uh, Software-defined networking is where you bring into more of like the um, inter-office mail kind of on top. So if you've ever worked in a big enough office um, where you have an inter-office mail set up, uh, I think it's less common now with yeah. email and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, but you'd have these fancy manila envelopes where you just put someone's name on it. So I'd, Heidi Joy. Yes. And I'd put the stuff in it, and I'd hand it to my internal mail person, who would then take it from there. Um, now, Heidi Joy actually worked in a different office. She's on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. So they would take that inter-office envelope, any other ones that were going to her office, and put it on a, a big external envelope with the address of the office and send it there. The mail person there would open that envelope, take out, and say, oh, OK, this goes to Heidi Joy. There's these other mail pieces in here, and they go there. So I don't actually know what's happening with that underlying network. In that case, like, I don't know it went to the post office, or I don't know it went on these internet routers, or, or how it got to her. I just know our internal mail system works by writing names on this envelope and passing it along. And that's kind of where that, the overlay networks come in. So overlay networks don't know about the underlying networks. You, you as a consumer just know about that top level network. So you know your private network of you know, 10, 10, 0, 0. Um, you put an IP address in there and it goes to it. You don't realize under the covers it's actually being encapsulated and sent maybe across multiple networks to get to the other side. So it's, it's that, that abstraction. You just don't even know about the underlying physical network. But at the same time, networking hasn't changed. You still have to write the address on the envelope to get it there. And that's where physical networking is still happening underneath. So no matter how you send that, that inner office mail, it still at some point is going in a physical envelope and, and heading on its way over. Yeah. Exactly. So the, at the end of the day, the process is still the same, but you're being abstracted from it to where you don't have to 
you don't have to deal with it, right? You're just kind of saying yeah. it's going to Heidi Joy. Yeah. And so then the, yeah, the two so, systems kind of. So the, the, the mailman, the actual US mail person is the, is the physical router. Yeah. My internal uh, mail person is my virtual router that I've created, my virtual networking. So all I know is I give it to them, and then they're smart enough and know how it works to hand it off to the, the appropriate physical router, which is the, the actual mailman. Just make sure that my fictitious Porsche gets in that <laughs> mail, and I'm good. Keys, the keys <laughs> in the title to your fictitious Porsche. <laughs> nice. Well, we had an idea for um, how why for-profit companies have an interest in supporting OpenStack, we had this idea to talk about rail. And once we did a bit more research, we stumbled on a phenomenal um, comparison. Uh, so in Australia, about 150 years ago, as they were building rail lines, they really only needed to build rail lines from wherever stuff was coming from or going <laughs> to the ocean. And it wasn't until they started networking literally networking their different rail lines together, that they realized they had created a very, very big problem, <laughs> which is they had three different sizes of rail line. They had the wide gauge, the regular gauge, and the narrow gauge. And so what ended up happening was um, by 1939, um, at, toward the beginning of, uh, of a war, uh, the three gauges were causing so much problem that they needed 1,600 people to move 1.8 tons of freight across from one boxcar to the next so that the, the, the contents could continue on their merry way to get to where they were going. So it would literally be like if you were shipping from one state in Australia to, to me, um, you would put it in a boxcar, send it to the end of your line, then some people would pick it up, move it into Tyler's boxcar, he would transport it over here, they would pick it up out of my boxcar, move it in, uh, and then it would be transported to me. So um, they have been they, working for 94 years to solve this in Australia, and it looks like they're, they finally solved the, the rail gauge issue. But um, we think that OpenStack is a lot like making a rail network system, that the underlying infrastructure, which is the standards and the infrastructure itself, make everybody's uh, uh, benefit everybody. Uh, because we see the for-profit companies um, in our ecosystem as being the, the boxcar creators or sellers, or maybe they even not only sell boxcars, but they will also operate them for you. And so it's in their best interest to have one consistent standard so they don't have to make three different kinds of boxcars to go on the three different rail sizes. Um, how, how else might you add to that analogy? Well, well I, think, I think that's the that's big piece is just because the idea is like, oh, the rails, um, you're not directly profiting from the, the physical rails themselves. Why would you contribute to this system and standard? Yeah. It's, but it, it enables everything else. So if you're a Marantis or an IBM or SUSE or Red Hat, or having everyone kind of all having that same rail line, you can, it, it increases your scalability and also cuts down on, on duplicate work. Think about when you had basically three different systems. You probably had three different sets of engineers working on designs for systems mm -hmm. for all those different ones. There's all this duplicate effort that happens. Yeah. And I think that's really the big thing is cutting down on the duplicate effort it brings uh, commercial value to those companies, not just it's good for the community. And I think innovation as well, right? Like just in, in the railway example, it'll be connecting more cities faster because now you can have teams that go, okay, I got this route, you got this route. We're all working on it together. We're all yeah. funding it together. And you can get you know, more routes or in this case, more services possibly faster. Yeah and you're bug stomping, you know, yep. you repair one little piece of the rail line, and that's not only gonna benefit your goods moving across the rail line, it'll benefit everybody else, um, but it's part of being a good citizen and maintaining the rail line. Exactly. Yeah, I think sometimes it's, it's hard for people to make that, because there's not a direct connection to revenue, that it's more of an indirect, um, but I think this is, a, this is a perfect example of how, you know, in the end, everyone benefits. Yeah. Whether you're making money off it or even just you're, you're an OpenStack user who uses the open source code, you don't make any profit from it, you're just a consumer, you're still benefiting from these people that do make money off it contributing and being involved. Yeah, and you benefit So from if you had like one of those little hand carts on the, on the rails, you still benefit by a standard rail line, right? <laughs> yeah, you benefit from not only the size and scope of the infrastructure and how good the infrastructure is, but yeah. you also benefit benefit from those consistent standards or costs. Yeah. I think where's the question? A question? Or the shipping container system as another option. Yeah, you're right, because they had the same, they had to standardize so that way they could fit more efficiently, fit more and, 
Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, we've got one more, uh, and uh, Shamil, you want to take it away? Explain yeah, us. Yeah, ab absolutely. So we the drinking. <laughs> when we were talking about coffee, we kind of discussed, you know, uh, the difference. What would be called uh, the consumption models of of cloud, or sorry, deployment models. This is the consumption models of cloud. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, what we thought about was, okay, coffee was good. Now let's switch over to something more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's Drinks. late in the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, you have you know different deployment options here, or consumption options. You can have a public cloud, a private cloud, or even a community cloud. And really, the difference here becomes uh, much like a bars. You can, when you want to drink, you can go to a public bar, and you can pay for that one drink that you want, and you know, they'll bill you for it, and you're off and gone. Um, but every time you want that drink, you're coming to the bar, you're buying that one drink, and so you know, at the end of the day, you're like, you know what, maybe I want to have my own yeah. bar or have a party yeah. that I want to host. And that's where the private cloud or home bar comes into play, mm -hmm. where you do a little bit more investment up front. Now you're not paying for one drink anymore. Yeah. You're paying for, you know, building the bar, stocking the bar, and everything. But now it's yours to use whenever and with however many friends that you have that, that are invited. So you can have your own parties. You can have your own choice of what drinks you want in the bar and everything. And uh, so, so that's like you know the private cloud model, but again, you're investing a little bit more upfront. And then you've got an in-between model here called community cloud, or in this case, a club. So in, in some parts, uh, they still have a concept of uh, social clubs where you have to become a member, and then once you're a member, you get access to the bar and you can order drinks and everything. And so community cloud is similar to that, where you're taking the concept of the home bar but saying, you know what, I, I, I really want this, but I don't want to go it alone in terms of investment and everything. So you chip in with a few of your pals uh, yes. in, in the neighborhood, yes. and you all put together this community cl cloud, or a club in this case. And there you're still you know, stocking the drinks, but now you're, you're sharing the burden mm -hmm. of the investments, but you're all benefiting from the investment as well. Yeah, I think, I think the key about that is there's usually some common theme. So a social club, that you're generally sharing some sort, you know, if it's the VFW, it's veterans, if it's, you know, mm -hmm. there's some overlying interest that you share. And I think community cloud is the same way where it's research organizations or healthcare. So mm -hmm. they, have, they have some uh, education, they have some overlying interest that they share that makes sense for them to share a cloud. Exactly. And, that, and, and generally, it's, like, it's also a difference of, you know, if you have a, if you have a public bar, for example, They'll generally stock, you know, they'll, they'll have sufficient Everything. stock. Yeah. Yeah. So chances are very rare that you're going to go there and order your drink and they'll say, sorry, we don't have it. In the private cloud, you know, you, you can have a lot of resources, but you got to buy those resources up front. So there is a situation where if you didn't plan accordingly, someone could yeah. want that next beer and you're like, sorry, that one's gone. So yeah, the, the other, more planning. Yeah, the other challenge on the public side is you, because you're buying per drink, you're definitely paying a lot more than when you're stocking your bar when you work out the drinks. So you know, going to the hotel bar and getting 20, 20 euro drinks. Yay. Uh, you know, once you start drinking a lot of them, that gets pretty expensive. 10.97, but. <laughs> I, but on the other hand, you, if, you, if you really just want the one drink, you yeah. don't need to go to the time and expense of an entire yeah. private bar setup. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need to blow 10 grand to set your basement up as a bar when you want you know, a drink a week. Although I can think of some people who would justify it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and I think even private can, can kind of break that into two modes too. So home bar, we're talking about kind of local, on-premises, private cloud. There's a concept of dedicated or a hosted private cloud. And I think that's where it comes into where you can rent a room yeah. So, so like if you go to, you know, you want to have a Super Bowl party. Go to a courtyard, or, Marriott Courtyard, yeah. rent the conference Get a VIP room, yeah. room at yeah. a club. And you say yeah. like, hey, we want to rent this room. You know, you have less options than at your home bar. They have a set list you can choose from. But again, it's, it's dedicated resources where the other problem with the public cut sometimes, especially if it's a busy Friday night, you may be trying to get the bartender's attention for a while there to get your drink. Whereas in a, you're getting that, hey, this is just our group of friends and we, we have a private room for our event. Um, but we don't want to blow 10 grand and... and set up a bar in someone's basement. So we, we want to dedicate Some people it. would call that yeah. a wise investment, yeah, though, Tyler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. <laughs> Great. Well, we have a question in the back. What kind of bar is a hybrid cloud? What kind of bar is a hybrid cloud? Mm, that's a good one. <sighs> Let's see. Because yeah. this is a good question. Yeah, that is a good um, question. Also, because we talked a lot about these analogies and where did the analogies break down? Um, and in a lot of cases, when when you take them to the logical extreme, they can break down. So, yeah. what, what are you thinking? 
What? Hybrid cloud would be the Vegas Strip, <laughs> where you can get a drink in a hotel and then take it into your own private room and hang out with your friends. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. Well, I mean, even think about it. Think about it this way: as the next level, so as a hybrid cloud, generally, it's you, you have some public cloud resources and you have some private cloud resources. I mean, you can do that now. I mean, I have a neighbor who has a basement bar. But he still goes to the bar pretty regularly when he wants something he doesn't have in his basement, or you know. So I think those it's it's managing those resources. The question is, what would be that abstraction layer that that's kind of managing yeah. that? Is mm. that might exactly. be his wife, you know, kind of saying if we can go to the bar or not, or yeah. interesting. Hey, we have a bar in the basement already. What do you, why are we going out to the? And bar? then generally, it's also you know whether we're talking about um, a workload running on two clouds or bursting, where we're running on one workload and we're bursting into the yeah. other. So. So well, maybe that's it. So you have your 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 private room that you've rented, but way more people show up you, than you, you ran out of drinks. And you yeah. said, hey, we're going to have to go to the bar out there because mm -hmm. we're all full up in here. Or we have our private party at home, <laughs> and then we're doing a 50th birthday bash for someone, so we decide to go elsewhere for that. Yeah. OK, we have time for a couple more questions. Ooh, we are good. <laughs> High fives all around. <laughs> well, there are uh, nine analogies that we hope that you will test and uh, also find the logical uh, kind of points where they break down. Um, any final thoughts on, on kind of this process for us? I had a blast doing it. And it was really interesting because we started with analogies and you know, you'd pick the first thing that came to mind and then you'd start testing it and it would break down and you'd go somewhere else. But really, it, it ended up being like a lot of these analogies that we did choose, we chose because they were so deep in terms of there were multiple dimensions that they could address. And so that was a really fun process overall. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, those were the interesting ones where you're like, it's like this, yes. And then, well, what, well, what, would, what would this be? And then you're like, mm -hmm. oh, no, that doesn't, that doesn't or, work at all. What, what happens to my cars yeah. in the valet parking scenario, yeah. if, if the valet gives back my one car that has no door ding, uh, well, what does he do with these other cars that he printed on his three-day printer? Well, and he crushes them and then uses those resources to build the next one. <laughs> depending on if the object storage has the security codes in place that require him to crush them. But yeah. maybe if he's a bad guy, he turns around and sells them elsewhere. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Data leakage. Do I see one other question over here? Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks.